So now here we are with uh, Richard Robinson, who I remember from the Covent Garden Community Theatre, which was, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's why Richard's here, um, but th there wouldn't be uh, a performing space that's worldwide famous now in Covent Garden, not all the, the beautiful building wouldn't be there if it, if it wasn't uh, really for, for, for you, Richard, and... Uh, <laughs> and the team of people that, that they were working with at that time. Set the scene for us. So if we go back to the 70s. The Good grief. OK, uh, when I'd finished being a student, I was a bit uh, anxious about going up to London because I didn't know what to do quite. So eventually, um, I landed up in London, I went straight to the centre of it, and I started working in a little place, a little sort of room called the Little Theatre. Uh, and that was a place where pretty ropey shows went to die, and bad playwrights went to find out how bad they really were. Uh, and I was working in this shambolic place, little knowing that although on one side was the West End, on the other side was a struggling community, Covent Garden, uh, which I just thought was a bit of a mishmash, but it turned out Covent Garden's got boundaries, it had limits, it had a terrain which had been set up over 400 years before, 350 years ago, uh, um, and the people in there were very proud of their domain. The other side of Charing Cross, they couldn't give a hoot. That's so. Uh, the Covent Garden, we were proud. They were very patriotic, you know, had to live on the right side of the road. So, uh, uh, at the time, the GLC, the Greater London Council, which was run by uh, a Tory by the name of Horace Cutler, so Tory that he had a spotty bow tie. Horace Cutler uh, and his cronies of the Tory GLC wanted to knock it all down and build conference centres and uh, hotels and, and uh, multi-lane motorways and all kinds of fancy things. There were people living there. So they thought, we'll take them and we'll decant them, as they poetically said, down to Sidcup. They won't mind, will they? They'll get better accommodation. And the people of Covent Garden were furious. They said, hang on a minute, we survived Hitler, and we're not going to survive, you know, our enemy we managed to live through, and now our friends want to destroy us. So, Tories though they were, they decided to get pretty radical, and they were behaving like the best revolutionaries in the world. They had torchlight processions, they were going on parades outside the houses of councillors they didn't like, they were burning them in effigy, they were doing everything wicked, uh, and of course I had to join in with that, didn't I? So at the back end of, Co of the little theatre I went and joined the fight in Covent Garden, and we were joined by many others, all of the revolutionary ill. Uh, <clears throat> one of them, of course, was Maggie Pinhorn, not that Maggie, and also this Maggie, of course. This is, um, <laughs> this Maggie, may she rust in peace, this Maggie was the patron saint of satire. She set so many, I got so much work out of her. Uh, so, uh, um, doing shows for her and her friends, Horace Cutler and the other. So you see, there were two camps here, set one against the other. There was Maggie on one side and Maggie on the other. One of the things that Maggie wanted to do was to uh, propagate the good news about Covent Garden and where it was going to go and where it wasn't going to go. Uh, and so I set up a theatre company that was going to do that. Named, as you say, poetically, the Covent Garden Community Theatre. What a thunderingly bad name that was. Better than the Workers' Revolutionary People's Theatre Cooperative, which was another one of an even more radical nature. The Covent Garden Community Theatre was so named so that Covent Garden would be in the news uh, and um, oh it's called the Community Theatre Workshop originally. Community was a good word, you always get grants from the Arts Council if you call yourself a uh, community and workshop had good uh, left-wing credentials so we called ourselves this boring ghastly name so that we would be able to um, get grants and eventually we did of a sort. I think I remember got my, my first payslip, £25 that sweet. That was equity minimum. Was that so? <laughs> I was a rule follower right from the start. Good old me. So uh, there we were setting up doing all these shows. And where do we, what were we going to do? Well, uh, in Covent Garden, there was an enormously wonderful history. Because Covent Garden was originally built by the Duke of Bedford, who was a good old Tory, just like Nagy, to make some money. He built this, uh, what he called a piazza, to mimic the Italian piazzas. Unfortunately, in Italy, they would got sunshine, which made it OK to have those arches with the darkness underneath. But over in England, it just made it gloomy. However, there was the market, so-called mud salad market, because it was a terrible Tip. You paid to bring your food in to be sold, and you paid to take it out again. So Duke of Bedford was making double money. So he was, 
<laughs> well up with the normal uh, line of country around there. And he built this church um, in the site of the original convent garden, which is why it's called Covent Garden. I had to research all this for the first show, which is why I'm so damned knowledgeable about it. And as um, uh, soon as he'd set this thing up, a guy came over from Italy and set up his little puppet show under the portico. Uh, it was a commedia dell'arte with puppets. Uh, and uh, so that was the first beginning of Punch and Judy there in the portico. Um, and uh, the Duke of Bedford's guys wanted to get rid of him, but he, they couldn't because he was on church property. And the vicar didn't mind, but he did start minding because when they started swinging the bell for the church service on one side, the congregation would go in on one side and the crowd would appear on the other side because that was also the bell for the beginning of the Punch and Judy show. So there were two shows going on simultaneously, one for God and the other for Punch and Judy. One secular and one holy. Great uh, shows they were. Eventually, of course, he was uh, banned from doing it uh, and he went his way and spawned all the Punch and Judys in the world. But in honour of that, on the 300th anniversary of his uh, first appearance, or at least Samuel Pepys's first spotting of it, they set up another Punch and Judy festival. And the buskers also set up in the portico. The Duke of Bedford's men had been replaced by now by the GLC's men. The GLC's men want them out, but the uh, vicar, the Reverend John Arrowsmith, said, no, you can't because they're on church property. So history, 300 years later, was repeating itself. Covent Garden was once more the home to buskers and to ne'er-do-wells, all sheltering under the auspices of the church. And to begin with, the buskers had to stay within the pillars of the portico. They weren't allowed to stray outside. However, the audience could stay outside, so they would watch from the uh, Duke of Bedford's area, rather the GLC area, uh, uh, watching the buskers inside. Eventually, the GLC, in their wisdom, realised that actually there was a market to be made here. There was a bit of trade. We were, we were actually attracting people in. So they they um, allowed it to happen. In fact, now they endorse it. They've got two busking sites actually within the market because they know it's good for trade. But it took some time. And Maggie had to stick to her guns for a long time. She was a great pioneer. Still is. Still is. Now, now tell us about some of the work that the Covent Garden Community Theatre itself was doing. The job of the community theatre was to, of course, do propaganda. Uh, so we had to do shows, we wanted to do shows, about the GLC and their wicked ways and the good people and how they combated with them. Of course, eventually, you started to think, well, we've done this show before. We did three or four shows a year, uh, and each one was on the same theme. So we were constantly looking for a new way to present the old sin. Uh, and um, naturally, because also of the Punch and Judy um, connection, we started thinking about puppets. We started doing puppets. Uh, puppets have a great advantage. One, they're very attractive. So if you do them in a pub, we were touring around the pubs in the area, if you do them in a pub, people will immediately drop their punt and look in your direction. Two, you hold them up in the air, and so people can see them over the heads of the other punters, which is good news. Um, three, you don't have to pay them. Four, you can pack them in a bag afterwards. Five, you've got fantastic disguises. Six, you've got a fantastic caricature, so you can change your caricatures minute by minute. So on one occasion we had uh, a two-faced politician. I had a face on the back of my head, one there. So if anybody was talking to me, I'd give them blandishments. If they wanted to complain, I'd swivel around and there would be the Labour Party on that side. Another time we had a puppet with two heads, the Labour and the Conservative, and they spent their time arguing between them and they completely ignored the people down in the market. Another type, uh, this is where Keith Allen came in, Keith Allen played an alien. A part which he has perfected over the years. His whole family seemed to be playing that part. Anyway, Keith Allen was an alien, swanning in from the GLC, from uh, County Hall, to see how the people were doing, and then he would waft off again uh, on his spaceship. So we were constantly thinking of new ways to doing it. And it was a challenge, but a delightful challenge, year on year. And of course, some people came around eventually and saw us doing the Ogle Ogle box, which was a, a box that you seemed to hold in your hand. What a fantastic piece of imagination this was. Who thought that up? I don't know. <laughs> you seemed to be holding this box in your hand, and out of it would pop Punch and Judy puppets. And they would perform, and then they'd go down in the box, and everybody would say, It must be magic. <laughs> and it was a totally original, totally original idea, which I nicked from a circus act I saw, kind of semi-nicked. And then, you know, I saw a print of a Chinese fair, which was printed some 500 years after the invention of paper. That's about 500 AD. There was the Ogle Ogle box, live and kicking. 
So there is nothing new. Uh, all the satire that we did then, all the satire that we do now, thinking they're original. No, no, no. They were doing it in Neolithic times. Extraordinary. Really. JJ and I were talking earlier and saying about how, how both about early influences were this gypsy Johnny Eagle who used to prefer, okay, he performed down at uh, Tower Hill. He'd swing a huge chain around his head and <laughs> a, a, a whip on the end of it and crack it. Yes. And, uh, and he was a really sort of feral uh, performer. And, uh, both, both JJ and I had seen him when we were children and yes. he stayed with us. You know, so you our do. styles were similar. You keep these images, don't yes. you? You keep these extraordinary memories. I presume that, that, that the memory of us is in the brains of some of these lads around here now. The little niche that belongs. I remember once we were doing a show and uh, it was pouring with rain. We'd been booked to do the show, we were being paid. So we weren't going to stop doing the show, but we weren't going to wet, get wet either. So we sat under the portico doing it, and they said, if they want to get wet, they can. And a guy was coming by doing a bit of, um, uh, it was on an errand, he had a bicycle with him. And you know what it's like with a busker? The idea of a busker is you've got the audience, it's basically going like this. They're sideways on. They want to carry on doing their shopping or whatever. And you're holding them and you're, think, you're thinking, can I get them to swivel? And if I go around like this, you think, triumph. <laughs> <laughs> and this kid was on his bike, <laughs> like this, in the pissing rain, sorry. <laughs> Water trickling down him and he's going, like this. <laughs> I think he was probably wetting himself, but you couldn't tell. <laughs> It was great. That, those moments stick with you. Like the moment that I was inspired to do something like that when I was five and I saw a juggler outside a pub somewhere in Surrey. And that memory's never quite gone. So these things, they do. Actually, the big, big influence on all our lives, I think, was the Ken Campbell Roadshow. Yes, yes, Ken Campbell. All the stuff. I mean, the smallest theatre in the world yes. first turned up at the, uh, the Covent Garden. The first Covent Garden market, the first, sorry, not the first Covent Garden, the first Covent Garden Festival happened in two, uh, 1975, another thing organised by Maggie. And this was to get the festival, get the local community to realise that they were strong, they were powerful, they were a community. It was great for them. And a few tourists came in from outside, but not very many at that time. It was for the locals there. And it was in a bomb site. The place was strewn with bomb sites there. Um, Fred Collins, a local activist, he was a sort of guerrilla gardener. He would slip out in the middle of the night and he'd remove a paving stone and stick a tree in there. And the next day the council would go around sweeping and say, tree, don't remember the tree, tree. <laughs> Years later it would be quite big and they'd look in their plants and say, I don't remember the tree, never mind, we'll park it in because it's obviously there. So he greened Covent Garden, he was very clever. Anyway, he built the Japanese water garden in there and all the buskers went down there and did, the buskers came from nowhere. They came out from under the paving stones, from out the woodwork, from doors, from clouds. Bang! They went down there and they did their stuff. And of course, Sid and Eric Rasputin were there with the home vasectomy kit. What was it you said? Oh, uh, 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 slash, slash, and Bob's your auntie. <laughs> slash, slash, and Bob's your auntie. <laughs> and I, it wasn't raining, but I was standing there watching you exactly like that kid was watching us later. Inspiring stuff. And you knew you were being inspiring because you were about five foot from the neighbouring well, well, busking well, JJ, uh, I think, turned it beautifully earlier on. He said that uh, uh, he, he discovered that when he was doing this that he was investing in the imaginations of the, uh, of, of the younger people. Yes, yes, yes. Which I think is a beautiful way of putting it's it. It's fantastic, the flow that happens. Yes. When you've been away from it, you, you don't... You, you know, if you've never been there, you don't know. When you've left it for a little while, you forget. But as soon as you go back and do something to an audience, they throw their enthusiasm back in there. And that fires the brain to fire something back at them. So you can only truly improvise, only truly create stuff. When you've got a crowd in front of you, please, just sitting in your room, it's nothing. You just ideas come out. When you've got them there, you've got a plan, of course, but you never know what's going to happen. I think it was, it was Eisenhower who said, uh, plans are useless. Planning is invaluable. Remember that, children. <laughs> Nobody's are quite right. I mean, I, I remember when I was doing shows there that I'd have a structure of, you know, three tricks, do this, do that, the odd kind of funny line that I yes. would hope to get in. Yes. But <laughs> most of the, the the way the show developed was through, through actually doing it out in the street. Yes. It, it was stuff that came from the audience and you learned to be part of that, be in the moment with that, yeah. with the audience. So you'd be pushing out and you'd be giving out and receiving. It was about giving out and receiving and, and relaxing in, 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 in 
in that energy uh, flow. Though. It's a great flow, and, it, it, and it's, it, it, it's an eddy as well. It flows in all directions. Yes. So you can't ever be sure that a line that was a dead cert yesterday will work today. Exactly. And you learn that when a line doesn't work, you've got to find somewhere else to go. So every line has got a provisional laugh, but if not, you've got somewhere else to go just after. When, you were, when you're mature, you don't only go down the river, you go down on either bank as well, because you know that somewhere <laughs> it's going to change course. It's fantastic, wonderful, wonderful business. Uh, I, I just want to ask you something else now, Richard. Uh, in those early days when the bus was first started there, and, and alternative arts and, and, and got everything set up, there was a great diversification <laughs> of, of uh, performances. Um, have you got any views on sort of what's happening with Covent Garden now? Or? Well, it was started quite early on that people would go there and they'd. Uh, it, it, was, it became like a job. It's odd when you think you're a busker. Uh, uh, you shouldn't be doing a job, you should be more spontaneous. But there tended to be a list so that you made sure you, were, you, you knew when your booking was. And they tended to fill it in. And the first, people were there first said, Well, I'm doing 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. Two o'clock, and he went along, and he said, "Well, I can just squeeze myself in there." And by the time the third person had come along, that was a day done. And later on, of course, they started having babies, so they were dependent on this office, as it became, uh, for their work. And, and if you went along and you weren't one of the crowd, you were frozen out gently but persuasively. So it wasn't a friendly place to be. Maggie's job, of course, was to make sure that didn't happen. Uh, at that time, there were so many buskers that wanted to get in there uh, that she was saying, well, give them a chance. So she'd have special days. She'd have a Hiroshima's day or uh, uh, a Williams day or a uh, I'm going to do what the hell I want day. Uh, and that completely kept us on, <laughs> um, um, off balance. Uh, we weren't there very often. The, the Covent Garden Community Theatre workshop um, tended to go into pubs and clubs and, and uh, roam around the place because there were four or five of us. Uh, and it's quite you know, quite a large crowd. You couldn't keep an income, couldn't earn an income as a, as, as a, as a crowd. Interestingly, that's the story of Punch and Judy as well. I don't know if you've got time for this. Yes. But when Punch and Judy first set off, it was a theatre with marionettes, and there was a cast of four or five people all dingly dangling the marionettes down there. Uh, but during the Napoleonic War, during the recession there, uh, the puppeteers fell back on the hard times, so they had to cut down the number of puppeteers they had with them. So therefore they found that instead of having one, they could have two if they used their hands instead. In fact, they could have three. Oh no, they make that four. So the Punch and Judy that we know today set off as a result of stress. Stress is a great uh, inventive spirit. Necessity was the mother of that invention. It was great to see it happening. So uh, uh, again, the buskers had to um, beat one person shows as much as possible. Yeah, well, Jim, Jim was sort of touching on that earlier on, but I mean, that's what got him to uh, Covent Garden was uh, necessity. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he got down to Tower Hill, which is nothing. Uh, yes. And then he uh, turned up. Well, there. then, of course, it became um, uh, it became what you want to go to see. And then you do some idle shopping rather than you go to shop and you may see a busker or two. Uh, it became quite an attractive. And the two flowed across each other. By the time it was an attractive place to go, the attraction had gone. And it, it is now a kind of routine. I'll tell you what I'd like, I'd like to ask you. In the, I, I do remember in the other day, nobody ever auditioned. If it's flashing, does that mean anything interesting? Uh, it means probably. Uh, uh, we are still recording, so but, so uh, the battery's about to go. What do you think of the idea that now the, uh, they, they have to audition for the, for the uh, Covent Garden office, uh, which is security guards? <laughs> oh, it raises the standard, I suppose, but it loses the spontaneity. I think uh, the great days are right behind us now. Almost as soon as you left, John, <laughs> you're gone. That is a lovely way to finish. The battery is about to go. Richard Robinson, Covent Garden, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.